Welcome to episode 6 of the Metamagic's Monster Manual, taking all of your favorite monsters from gaming and shoving them into a Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition stat block. This is page 3 of the Dead by Daylight chapter. In the previous two, we covered the Trapper and the Wraith, who were very simple in scope for their stat blocks. This time we're going to go over one of the more complicated monster stat blocks that I have made for the Hag. So this might be a bit of a longer episode, so strap in and let's talk about it. So this is the hag, and for her step block, I wanted to make this a more of a tail-end beginner encounter that you could throw at your players in terms of Dead by Daylight monsters. The first two were a bit easy on the easy side. They had pretty simple perks to go with, about only about 100 HP. What I wanted to do for the hag was make her a more fragile monster who relied on all of her hex perks to sort of snowball should the party get complacent and not deal with them accordingly. So to begin, the hag is a medium monstrosity with the chaotic evil tag, a tag shared by all of the Dead by Daylight killers. She has an armor class of 14, which is her natural armor bonus, and a hit point total of only 75, notably weaker than the other killers, but we'll get to why that is later. And she has, just like all the other killers, a speed of 35 being slightly faster, than any of the usual party members you would have. For the stat array, there's nothing too crazy here. She has a notably higher dexterity as she is much more nimble and quick on her feet. And she also has a bit higher of an intelligence as she is a killer that I have designed to be very tricky and be a heavy user of deception to outwit party members. As with all the other killers, she has an immunity to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks but again, could be toned down to a resistance to those attacks if your party is low on magic. She has a passive perception of 11 and speaks no languages and is a challenge rating of 5. Now before we move on to all of her unique abilities, I do want to go over her one action that she has, which is her swipe attack, which is a plus 5 to hit, 5 foot range, and only does 1d6 plus 2 slashing damage. Now this may seem very low compared to the others, but we'll get to why in a minute. So moving on to the abilities, the hag almost entirely relies on her special power, the blackened catalyst or her phantasm traps, as well as her three hexes, devour hope, ruin, and the third seal. Now we can jump into the, some gameplay and explain how all of these were put into a stat block. So let's get into that. So to start, the Hag's main ability is her Phantasm Traps. At the start of the encounter, the Hag starts with 1d4 Phantasm Traps located within 60 feet of her at locations of the DM's choosing. Traps are shaped like rune-like triangles, and as a bonus action, the Hag may use her finger to draw a trap on the ground at her location. A DC 18 perception check is, re is required within 30 feet of the trap in order to see it. These traps do blend in with the ground very well, so it is going to be a quite high DC. You can lower it again if your party isn't too well skilled in this. And when a creature moves at full speed within a 5 foot radius of a phantasm trap, the trap triggers and a copy of the hag appears and makes a single melee attack against a creature before disappearing into the ground at the end of that creature's turn. Moving past a trap as though it were difficult terrain, meaning using double your movement for every square will prevent the trap from triggering. However, the hag may use her reaction to teleport to the location of a, any triggered phantasm trap and make the attack instead. The trap will disappear preemptively if it is hit with any radiant damage. The hag may control up to 10 phantasm traps at once. So the idea behind this is if the hag decides she wants to make the attack, she could teleport to the location, make the attack, and then the party member cre other creature has to decide whether or not they want to make the attack on the hag or whether it's just a decoy and then they'll waste their action so there is a good amount of deception there to work with should you use this feature of her appropriately as a decoy would not disappear until the end of that creature's turn so some difficult choices will have to be made there moving on to her actual abilities we have her hexes now her hexes are meant to introduce your party to the concept of hexes if you decide to run any of the future killers that I'll be putting out that include hexes in their kits. So let's explain them. First off, we have Hex Devour Hope. At the start of the encounter, a small totem of bones is placed at a location within 60 feet of the hag at a location of the DM's choosing. This hex is placed on that totem and remains as long as the totem is not destroyed. Any creature can use an action to break the totem should they find it. 
However, a DC 14 perception check within 30 feet of the totem is required to find it. While this hex is active, every time a creature other than the hag is healed during the encounter, the hag's melee attacks gain an additional damage die. This effect stacks up to a maximum of five times, and it also affects the hag's decoy attacks. So this ability plays into the snowbally nature of the hag, who starts out very weak, dealing only 1d6 damage. But should this totem, hex totem, remain completely unchecked and unfound, and creatures decide to keep healing after taking little amounts of damage, the hag's attacks will start going up higher and higher until they start hitting for 6d6 plus 2 damage, which could down very well down a single party member in one hit if they are low enough level or have low enough hit points. So it is up to the party to find and destroy these totems as quick as possible. So with that in mind, let's move on to the other two hexes, which is Hex Ruin to start. At the start of the encounter, the same totem of bones is placed and it can be destroyed just like the others. But with this one, while the hex is active, each time the hag takes damage during the encounter, roll a d4. The number rolled is subtracted from the damage dealt, so it is just a flat damage reduction as long as this hex totem remains active. Again, the party has to find and destroy this to remove this. This could prove very difficult to deal with for low-level party members if they do not find the hex. They might just not even deal any damage with some of their attacks. And with that, we move on to the third perk, which is Hex the Third Seal. Same deal with the totem. It spawns at a, at a location of your choosing. Put the hex on it. While this hex is active, any creature hit by the hag or her decoys is considered blinded as the blinded condition until the start of their next turn. Now, for those of you who might not know, a blinded creature takes disadvantage on all of their attack rolls against other creatures, and any attack rolls made against them also have advantage. So comboing this with the Hex Devour Hope, meaning that any attacks that deals possibly 6d6 damage might have advantage on you, is a little bit scary to deal with. So as a DM, your real objective when running this killer in your own game is to teach your party about the concept of hexes and how there should be a secondary objective beyond just killing the monster as fast as possible. Because while all these are active, any low-level party is going to have a really hard time should they not find and destroy the totems quick enough. Having an encounter with a killer like this, in my opinion, is a very good tutorial to teach any party about the concept of hexes. And should the party play smart and find all of these totems and destroy them, the encounter should go very swiftly, as the hag's hit point total and damage dealing capabilities are very low without any of them, so it is also your job as a DM to make sure that you are not playing too aggressive as the hag, Make sure you use her Phantasm traps very well, place them in key locations around the map so you can have your decoys do all the work, or if somebody gets separated from the group, you could teleport to them and attack them yourself if they're split up. There was a lot of possible ways you could play this killer, and I had a really fun time designing her in this way. But guys, that is how I would run the Hag from Dead by Daylight in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. This probably was the longest stat block that I've ever made, and it took me the longest. I had to tinker around so much with the numbers to get this balanced properly for the tail end of low-level parties, starting to go into mid-level parties if you wanted to throw this at them. As usual, a link to the stat block will be down in the description below. It'll take you to my Twitter, where you can find a picture of the post of the stat block. You can just download that, take it, use it in your own games, guys. Have fun with it. And if you guys have any suggestions on how you would change the hex mechanic or make any adjustments to anything that I've made in this stat block for the hag, let me know in the comments down below. I'm interested to hear what you guys think about this stat block, and that is going to do it for me for today, guys. I hope you enjoy this stat block, and I hope you enjoy running it as much as I will definitely have running it myself. So, until the next time, guys, have fun, stay safe, and as always, happy gaming.